Hi everyone, welcome to part one of England and its colonies. As a reminder, these slideshows are summaries of the material. Be sure to read the textbook and watch the Crash Course US History videos to help fill in the gaps on your outline. So taking a look at our questions to think about, why was Jamestown Colony founded? And how does Jamestown represent an example of other Southern colonies in terms of settlement, family patterns, economics, and government? In 1607, King James I chartered a joint stock enterprise called the Virginia Company. The hope was for the colonies to make the company wealthy with their settlement, and many thought the colonists would send gold and gemstones and exotic fruits back to England to make the investors rich. The company was given great leeway over the colonies and how it governed, but the colony nearly failed in the first three years. As it turned out, there were serious issues with the Virginia Company's vision. First of all, there was no gold or precious jewels in Virginia. Second, the colonists could not repeat the Spanish experience by lording over densely populated Na Native Americans because there weren't densely populated groups in this area like there were in Central and South America. And then finally, the men who traveled to Virginia were utterly unprepared to do the difficult work of colony building. And then the swampy conditions and widespread disease nearly decimated the colony. And then to make matters worse, the relationship between the colonists and the local Native Americans deteriorated, and the colonists were forced to hide out in their fort over an extended period of time. This is referred to as the starving time. One of the reasons why the Jamestown settlement didn't fail straight away was because of John Smith. John Smith had implemented an autocratic mode of governing that alienated many of the colonists. He had basically told the colonists that if they don't work, they won't eat. And then the other thing is John Smith set out to build a positive relationship with the local Native Americans, particularly the leader of a Native American confederacy named Powhatan. Now, where Disney got their version of the story is from the image on this slide. We see this image where John Smith is tied and restrained and his head is on a rock. And the man standing there with a club is Powhatan. And the woman draped over him, actually the child, because Pocahontas was only 11, the child draped over him is Pocahontas. And this scene actually happens because what's going on here is Pocahontas is acting as her father's ambassador. And it looks like she is sparing John Smith's life, but she's really saying, we trust this man. And Disney had taken all of this out of context and out of proportion. Uh, John Smith and Pocahontas were never lovers because like I said, Pocahontas was only 11 years old, but she does play an important role in building a strong relationship with uh, the English settlers at Jamestown. By the way, in 1609, John Smith was forced to leave Jamestown because of a gunpowder accident and he would never return. But sadly, uh, the relationship between the English and the Powhatan deteriorated and Pocahontas was kidnapped by settlers in 1613. She was treated very well by the English settlers and even converted to Christianity during her time there. And then in 1614, she married an Englishman named John Rolfe and their marriage helped to seal a period of peace. In 1616, Pocahontas, uh, sometimes using an English name, Rebecca, traveled to England with her husband, but she died before she could return to Virginia. Without a viable source of income, it was difficult for the Jamestown colony early on. In fact, they sort of limp along for several years until they find a lucrative source of income, which was tobacco. 
Tobacco does become a profitable investment, but it's also a labor-intensive crop that requires planters to purchase additional dentured servants to work the field. The problem with the Virginia colony when we compare it with England is England has a large population, relatively speaking, but they don't have a lot of land. The colonies have a lot of land, but they don't have a lot of people. So the idea is that people are willing to make the journey to Virginia and essentially sell themselves into slavery for a period of four to seven years. I mean, honestly, indentured servants were not treated very well, and the work they did was difficult. The climate conditions were difficult, and not surprisingly, early on, the vast majority of indentured servants didn't survive their term of indenture. But the reason they were willing to take this risk is because of the opportunity for what were called freedom dues. They would get a set of tools and land once they completed their terms of indenture. For most, most poor people living in England, they were never going to own land. But here was an opportunity to be self-sufficient, to be self-employed, and it was worth, worth the risk to them. Between 1625 and 1640, 1,000 or more indentured servants arrived every year. But people were looking to draw people with money into the colony, and that's where the headright system comes in. The headrights were 50-acre grants of land made to encourage more settlers to move to Virginia. So anyone who paid his own way to Virginia was granted land. More land was given for each person they brought over. So if you paid your way and brought five additional servants, you got 50 acres for yourself plus 50 acres for every person you brought over. So it was the opportunity for people with ample financial resources, the sons of merchants, English gentlemen. They take advantage of the headright system and their government connections to acquire large estates on the best lands. In 1619, a Dutch ship stopped at Jamestown and sold 20 Africans, the first that were known to have reached English America. Keep in mind that the Spanish and the Portuguese have used Africans as slaves for well over a century in their American colonies. And this is the first for the English. And at first, the English settlers in Jamestown treated the Africans as indentured servants, but it didn't take them long to see the advantage of forcing lifelong servitude. And although race as we know it today did not lead directly to slavery, the Africans were seen as so different in color, in religion, in social practices, that they were considered to be enslavable in a way that poor Englishmen were not. And we'll talk more about this idea of the social construction of race later on. But most importantly, because they're not Christians, they are enslavable and they could not claim protections under English law because they weren't English. The English colonies were beginning to make the shift from indentured servants to African, uh, African slaves, and the English were relative newcomers to the slave trade. The tobacco, rice, and sugar plantations of the southern colonies maintained the use of indentured servants long after the French, Spanish, and Portuguese had switched to African slaves. The English West Indian plantations in the Caribbean were the first to switch and then imported that practice to mainland North America. As time went on, the English began to solidify the slave codes. As the number of Africans increased, lawmakers constructed legal codes for strictly controlling slave activities. The white population of Virginia increasingly considered freed African slaves as dangerous and undesirable. And so Virginia law required that all freed slaves be sent out of the colony. And therefore, the words free and white 
became virtually identical in a legal sense. As time goes on, servitude becomes perpetual, meaning lifelong, and hereditary. This was something that differentiated slavery in the Americas from the slavery that had taken place all throughout human history, is that almost never was slavery a hereditary condition. But this is exactly what happens in Virginia and the rest of the southern colonies. When we take a look at Southern society, the head right system allowed a small minority of the population to acquire large tracts of land. Many indentured servants found it nearly impossible to escape indenture alive or to make a living afterward. And slaves quickly became no more than property or chattel in the eyes of the law. In addition, the high mortality rate in the southern colonies assisted in the consolidation of wealth. As the as wealthy individuals died, their widows or widowers remarried, and they're going to remarry other wealthy people. So we see this consolidation of wealth. Also, population growth depended upon the steady arrival of more colonists from Britain. And the economic problems were exacerbated by the imbalanced gender ratio because many more men relocated to Virginia than did women. We take a look at the first government of Virginia and initially in those first couple of years from 1607 really to 1619, Virginia is essentially under martial law. And in 1619, once that initial period of uncertainty passed, the Virginia Company allowed the colonists to run their affairs through a representative assembly. Now, according to the law, property holding white men could vote. And this is not remarkable in the sense that this is exactly the way it was in England, only property property holding white men could vote. But what made it different or even radical in the eyes of some living in England is that so many more men owned land in Virginia than in England. And so you're dealing with a more common class of men. It's not the wealthy, it's not the privileged, it's not the titled that own land. It's just common men. The House of Burgesses initially only met once a year, but it made important laws for the running of the colony. The House of Burgesses could be overruled by the governor or the directors of the Virginia Company. And then, like I said, the significance here is that only property holding men in England can vote. So the concept really is nothing new. But what is significant was the fact that so many more men in Virginia held property. And again, many considered this to be a radical development. After a major conflict with the Powhatan in 1622, which wiped out about one quarter of the white population of Virginia, the Virginia Company was forced to declare bankruptcy. In 1624, an English court dissolved the struggling Virginia Company and Virginia became a royal colony. Sir William Berkeley arrived in 1642 as the first royal governor, and he would control the colony for the next 35 years. Governor Berkeley is an interesting character because he advocated for the relative autonomy from England. In other words, letting the colony essentially run its own affairs. And he, along with the House of Burgesses, continued to make laws for the colony and resisted the... English government's interference. Uh, Governor Berkeley also tried to diversify Virginia's economy and to establish a profitable deerskin trade with local Native Americans. And in fact, it's this deerskin trade that's going to lead to a major issue. With the influx of new settlers and indentured servants, Virginia experienced social and the social and economic effects 
brought about by the limitation on good farmland. The wealthiest planters had bought up the most fertile land along the coast and along the rivers, and then freed freed servants and newcomers were forced to become tenants or move further inland. There's also an incredible amount of volatility within the tobacco market. So some years tobacco is worth a lot, the next year it's not worth much. And so this is going to be more stressful for the former indentured servants than it is for the wealthy. By 1676, one quarter of the free white men in Virginia didn't own any land at all, which fuels discontent. In addition to the economic perils, these landless men were not able to vote. And as more people moved inland, they faced hostile Indians and demanded protection from the governor. Governor Berkeley, though, wanted to maintain peaceful relations with Native Americans because of that profitable deerskin trade that he and his cronies were involved in. In 1676, Nathaniel Bacon defied the government's authority and organized a group of frontier vigilantes and began to attack Native American settlements indiscriminately. Bacon not only defied the governor, but led his troops against Jamestown, burning the town to the ground. The vigil antes had wanted the colonial government to provide greater security against the neighboring Indian tribes who had been attacking their farms and settlements on the frontier. But Bacon also had a bit of a personal vendetta against Governor Berkeley because Nathaniel Bacon was a wealthy man, but he was outside of the governor's favored circle and did not benefit from the governor's trade in furs as other wealthy men in Jamestown did. So Bacon called for the removal of Indians from the colony, a reduction of taxes, and an end to the rule by what he called the grandees. And he rapidly gained support from small farmers, landless men, and indentured servants. Of course, Governor Berkeley is not going to let this man defy his authority and indiscriminately attack Native Americans on the frontier. So the governor sends out the militia who end up chasing Bacon and his men around. Many of Bacon's men are captured and put on sort of a mock trial and hanged. Bacon himself would elude capture and ended up dying of dysentery in the swamp, which is not a good way to go. But Bacon's rebellion in 1676 has an incredibly important significance. Take a look at the graph here on the slide. It shows the timeline. From 1607 to about mid-century, the major labor source in Virginia was the indentured servants coming from England. But as the mortality rate improves, as people are surviving their terms of indenture, they're putting pressure on Native American settlements at the periphery of English settlements, and they're making demands for more and more land. Bacon's Rebellion tells us, tells the Englishmen in Jamestown, that we cannot continue to import so many indentured servants because eventually they're going to survive their terms of indenture and demand land. So the result, the the modification here, is that instead of using indentured servants, we would see a dramatic increase in the importation of African slaves. So coming back to our questions to think about, why was the Jamestown colony founded? It was designed to make money. It was a business enterprise and it struggles until it finds a lucrative crop and that is tobacco. So how does Jamestown represent an example of other Southern colonies? Its settlement early on is predominantly uh, those interested in making money. So the settlement is for economic opportunity. The family patterns are definitely mostly male. And then economics geared towards agriculture. And then finally, what about its government? Virginia is going to establish the first legislative 
house in the British North American colonies, and that is the House of Burgesses. So stay tuned for part two of England and its colonies.